hands together to welcome His Excellency, the Honorable Consul General of India, Mr. Prabhu Dayal. Thank you. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I am highly honored and privileged to have been invited to address you this afternoon. I am particularly grateful to Vinita Mehra for her extremely generous introduction. At the same time, I feel a little humbled by all the wonderful things she said. And I wonder whether I will be able to live up to the sort of expectations that she has generated by her very kind introduction. Let me mention that given the importance of this occasion, I had written a 40-page speech. <laughs> but you will be happy to know that I have decided not to read it, but to give you what Vinita said, a 30,000 feet overview of the cuff. <clears throat> it is, of course, as I said, <clears throat> a very great honor and privilege for me to be addressing you. This is so for a number of reasons. Firstly, of course, because I'm addressing a gathering in this beautiful hall under the aegis of the Columbus Council of World Affairs, which is a very, very prestigious body. It's an important event for me because I have this unique opportunity to address so many distinguished persons from mainstream life here in Columbus. I recognize here people who are businessmen, people from the world of finance, lawyers, doctors, and so on and so forth. So this is a highly representative gathering from Columbus, and I feel daunted by the occasion. Of course, being in Columbus is always a great delight. This is my third visit here. Because it brings to my mind the umbilical relationship between the United States and India. I was talking to my friend, the president of your council, and we recalled that your city takes its name from Christopher Columbus, and that when Columbus landed here in the United States, he was actually looking for India. <laughs> so in that sense, we have what I described last evening to another gathering, an umbilical relationship. Tragically, this relationship did not grow at an appropriate pace for several centuries. <clears throat> even after America became independent in 1776, India remained a colony for almost two more centuries. India got its independence only in 1947. And it's only thereafter that we were able to fashion out an independent foreign policy. Of course, tragically again, after we got our independence, came the phase of the Cold War. India was one of the leaders of the non-aligned movement, and we pursued an independent foreign policy. Somehow this came in the way of the natural fulfillment of Indo-US relations. The end of the Cold War, coming along with the opening up of the Indian economy has given rise to new vistas of cooperation between India and the United States. Let me mention 
that India and the US are natural allies. This is so for a number of reasons. You are the world's oldest democracy. We are without doubt the world's largest democracy. We have respect for human rights, both of us, for tolerance, for fundamental freedoms, for the rule of law. We are both secular societies. We are multicultural, multi-ethnic, multilinguistic, multiracial, multi-religious. So as I said, we have a lot of factors in common. We are tolerant societies. Of course, we don't live in a world which is particularly tolerant. And in today's day and age, we are confronted with certain global challenges. The first and foremost of these is the challenge posed by the extreme form of intolerance, terrorism. You had your 9-11. We've had a series of attacks on us. The most significant of these being the terror attacks on Mumbai in November 2008. It happened on the 26th of November, so it has come to be called India's 26-11. The forces which attacked you on 9-11 have very direct links with the forces which attacked us on 26-11. In this sense, we are confronted with a certain network of radicalism, of extremism, of terrorism, which is targeted against all open societies. We are witnessing an age of open society and its enemies. India and the United States are fighting on the same side. This is why the last decade has witnessed an exponential growth in our relations. I recall President Carter had visited India in 1977. And thereafter, the next president to visit India was only President Bill Clinton. That was followed, of course, by President George Bush's visit. And we are happy to note that President Obama would be visiting India in November this year. So after a period of lull, there has been a spurt in the development of our bilateral relations. Some of you would recall that India's Prime Minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh, visited in Washington in November last year as the first state-level guest of President Obama. That was the first state banquet that the Obama administration hosted, and it was for India's Prime Minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh. That shows the level to which the relationship has been upgraded and continues to be upgraded. Last July, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton visited India for what turned out to be an extremely productive visit. In particular, that set in motion what was called the strategic dialogue. India and the United States upgraded their relationship to the level of a strategic relationship giving rise to the strategic dialogue which took place recently in Washington, D.C. with the participation of several secretaries from the United States government and several ministers from the Indian government. The attempt was to see how we could have an in-depth cooperation and upgrade this relationship to more and more meaningful levels. Of course, a relationship can only grow if there are 